Our scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love that scripture. This Tuesday kicks off Mardi Gras. Does anyone here this morning know what Mardi Gras actually means when translated from French to English? Mardi means Tuesday. In Spanish, it's martes. <laughs> and gras means fat. If you're a cook, an avid cook like I am, you've heard of foie gras, it's duck fat. <laughs> so Mardi Gras means Fat Tuesday. And although Mardi Gras does not come across as a holy festival, if you happen to visit New Orleans during that celebration, Fat Tuesday is most definitely derived from a very holy season, which we call Lent. I was sharing with a few people before we gathered for worship how, as odd as it might sound, I just love the season of Lent. There's just no pretense to it. There's no expectation of how we should do it. It's just, it's all just bare bones draw to Jesus. Surrender. Fast. Whatever it takes. If you gotta get some crud out of your life, do it. If you gotta add some good holy things into your life, do it. That's what Lent is about. And I just love that. I wish I lived every day in my life like it was a day in the season of Lent, <laughs> because it should be. But Lent is just a, a time for us all, together and individually, to just turn our hearts to the Lord and render them once again. And I like that. It's a time to reset. It's a time to consider what we should subtract from or add to our daily lives to draw us closer to God. The season of Lent lasts for 40 days. Traditionally, you don't include Sundays. And so from Ash Wednesday through Easter, that's 40 days when you take out the Sundays. I'm not one who takes out the Sundays for myself, but that's what a lot of people do, especially if they're going to fast. They're like, if I could just get through Sunday. <laughs> it gives them a, a mini holiday of whatever their fast is. But this 40 days, I mean, when you think about it, how many times do we hear 40 days in Scripture? Clearly, the 40-day 
time period is very important to our God. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses fasted two different times for 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai. Once after he received the Ten Commandments that we hear about in Exodus and Deuteronomy, and again when he came down from the mountain and discovered the infidelity of the Israelites when they had crafted the golden calf in his absence. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets other than John the Baptist, Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights after fleeing the wrath of Jezebel. I love his story because he was such a powerful man of God. If you've read the story of Elijah, he called fire down from heaven. But even so, his own frail human tendencies caused him to be afraid of the wrath of Jezebel and he ran and hide in a cave. It encourages me. Because you can be a mighty, mighty warrior, a prophet for God, and still have those weak, vulnerable moments, and God doesn't forsake you. The Ninevites fasted for 40 days to stave off the wrath of God, we find out in the book of Jonah. That's the, that's the example in scripture that I always go to when people say, well, God's will is going to be done because he's already made up his mind what's going to happen. I'm like, you need to read the story about the Ninevites. Because the Ninevites heard how angry God was with them, that they had turned from him and toward wickedness and started all these pagan practices and everything. And that's why Jonah jumped off the boat because he didn't want to go and tell them what God was going to do. He didn't want to be the bearer of that kind of terrible news that he was going to basically just wipe them out. He was done with them. But what did they do? They fasted. They repented. And they fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Authentically. Turning their heart back to God. And scripture tells us. It changed his mind. We're his kids. He loves us. He's not this big, angry God up in the sky that's like, nope, doesn't matter what you do now, I've already sealed your fate. He's a forgiving and merciful, grace-filled, loving God. And if we really do repent, and we really are sorry for what we've done, he'll show us mercy. So the Ninevites fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I think we need to make note of that. Now there are many types of fasts that are described in scripture, but the most common fast that was practiced in the Bible was a complete fast from food. Sometimes from water. I don't advise anyone going without water for 40 days. <clears throat> that better be something you are hearing clearly from God. <laughs> Because water is a big, big deal. Food, I do believe we can do without for an extended period of time. And as Lent evolved after the third century, a common Christian fast that was practiced for the season of Lent was a fast from meat, eggs, dairy, and fat. And that brings us back to Fat Tuesday that begins Mardi Gras. Fat Tuesday is the eve of Ash Wednesday, which we know starts the Lenten season. So many Christians would use up all the meat and the eggs and the dairy and the fat in the house to get rid of any temptations so that when they began their Lenten fast, they wouldn't be tempted to break it because there's a big slab of bacon in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. In fact, 
it became very common, and people still do it in a lot of churches, to have pancake dinners on Fat Tuesday. We belong to congregations where we would do that as a fundraiser for the youth. Fat Tuesday, we'd have a big can pancake uh, fundraiser, and it was all in that tradition of getting rid of the meat and the eggs and the dairy and the fat. So obviously, the most well-known celebration of Mardi Gras happens in New Orleans with a celebration that is anything but Christ-centered, we can all agree. But many faithful followers of Christ all over the world will be focused on something much different than what's going to go on in Louisiana this week. We will be recognizing this Lenten season reflecting on the passion of Christ as we remember the 40 days that he fasted in the wilderness before beginning his ministry. And it will conclude at the end of Holy Week where we will reflect together on the last few days Jesus walked this earth before his crucifixion, his death, and the resurrection. That's why it's so important for me to have a Good Friday service. I don't, I don't think it's right, and I'm not criticizing, but for me, it just doesn't feel right to go from Palm Sunday to Easter without visiting the cross in between. Because that cross, that's where it all happened. That's where he took our place. Each year, many of us recognize this event found in our scripture this morning, describing the transfiguration of Christ up on the mountaintop the Sunday before Lent begins, which is today. It's like someone feasting on pancakes before their Lenten fast. The transfiguration story gives us a heaping portion of God's glory before we start our reflective and disciplined journey through Lent. In our scripture this morning, Jesus gave three of his disciples who were closest to him, Peter, James, and John, a glimpse of his divine glory in all of its fullness. The days that would soon follow would lead to his trial, his crucifixion, and his death. And before things took a turn for the worse, albeit temporary. He wanted them to see his Shekinah glory. Has anyone ever heard of Shekinah glory before? Shekinah is not a word that you will find in the Bible, but it is an expression that the Jewish rabbis use that describes the visible manifestation of the presence of God. The Jewish rabbis call it Shekinah glory. Shekinah glory would be used to describe the burning bush or the pillar of fire that led the Israelites through the wilderness at night or the, the cloud that led them by day. It would be used to describe how the countenance of Moses reflected the glory of God so brightly after being in God's presence that he had to cover his face with a veil. Remember reading that scripture? It, it startled them when he had spent so much time in the presence of God that his countenance began to change like Jesus did up on this mountain, and the people were frightened by it, so he began to wear a veil. Shekinah glory. It's God manifested in a visible way here on earth. And Shekinah glory is what James, Peter, and John saw high up on that mountain when Jesus revealed his divinity in a visible way. Now they obviously already knew that he was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. They, they were on board with that at this point. And they had seen the miraculous in his midst. 
They had witnessed so many divine happenings, but they had not seen of the person of Jesus, this divinity, in a visual way yet. Until the mountain. The story of the transfiguration told in the Gospels, it puzzles and it intrigues us. And that's okay because it puzzled and intrigued those three disciples too. <laughs> in fact, a lot of things puzzled and intrigued them. And I think that we would have been alongside them as well. <clears throat> even so, even though they couldn't quite wrap their minds around it and they couldn't quite take it all in or even know how to respond to it with all of those things just swirling around in their minds and their experience, even so, they knew something really holy had happened. Something heavenly had happened. And that's when one of them was like, I need to make an altar, I need to do something, I need to help make some tents or some dwellings or give me some rocks, you know. He was like, I got to do something to memorialize this because this was something pretty extraordinary. You know, they needed to have a glimpse of his glory. They didn't know it. But Jesus knew what was about to happen. And he knew they were going to need a shot in the arm to boost their faith. He knew they were going to need a good, strong, healthy, extra strength dose of Shekinah glory to cement their faith so they could stand strong in the days ahead when they would witness him be brutally murdered. They were gonna need a little something to help them keep believing when what they were seeing with their eyes was contradicting everything they thought was supposed to happen. There's an author by the name of David Luce. He once said, if there's any scene short of the crucifixion that defies easy interpretation and serves to rock the world of those who witness it, it's this one. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain with him, and there he is changed, transfigured dramatically before their eyes. Just imagine. In our scripture this morning, Matthew seems to struggle to find vocabulary to do justice to what he witnessed. We see that a lot in scripture, don't we? We see it in Ezekiel, don't we? <laughs> and he's describing all the wheels within the wheels and, you know, all these things that he saw that he had no personal point of reference to explain. And so it was as Matthew began to try to explain this. And he says that Jesus' clothes became dazzling white. And his face began to shine like the sun. It's the only way he knew how to describe it. And even though the disciples were clearly amazed and perplexed, as they often were, in that dazzling light, they began to see and understand Jesus in a new way. It's one thing to believe something in faith. It's in another thing to actually see the evidence of heaven. And as we read and hear this account of what happened in scripture, we also find that not only was Jesus transfigured right before their eyes, glowing with Shekinah glory, but Moses and Elijah appeared with him as well. I just love that. It is clear evidence 
of the cloud of witnesses, of the believers who have gone before us, who are alive and well in heaven. We will see them again. Hallelujah. As you would imagine, I try to imagine myself on that mountaintop. <laughs> I encourage you to. How would you respond? How would it impact you for the rest of your life? I think it's important. Of course it's important what God had to say. You know, when Jesus came up out of the River Jordan, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus, or God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, or my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Well, he says the same thing here, but he adds something. God said, this is my son, the beloved with whom him I am well pleased. But he adds, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to what Jesus has to say. It's the same today as it was then. Listen to his instruction. Listen to his words of love and compassion and forgiveness and mercy and imitate them. Listen to his call to be his holy priesthood. When did we start buying into this cheap form of grace that we can just live our lives however we want to and ask for forgiveness later? That's cheap grace. We're called to be holy. Listen to his call to be his holy priesthood. Listen to who he is calling us to be, not who the world is calling us to be. People are getting confused these days. We do not have to be apologetic about trying to be the people Jesus calls us to be. If that upsets people, we need to pray for them and just say, Lord, bless them. <laughs> Listen to what he's calling us to do. Are we telling people about him? Does our heart break for what breaks his? Listen. That's what our father said. Listen. This particular verse is intentionally set on this particular Sunday each year as a reminder of how we need to approach the season of Lent. The season of Lent invites us to listen. To listen more intensely to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we run around doing all of these busy things that might be very good things. And we have these good intentions and we get ourselves stretched so far out that we forget to carve out a sacred space of time to be still and to sit in the presence of God to hear what he has to say. Let me tell you, I'm one of those people. I'm a busy, busy person. <laughs> I mean, even on my day off, I don't like to just sit around. I mean, that's... That's not relaxing to me to just do nothing for hours on end. It's not my personality. No, that might shock you. <laughs> I like to be productive. That's gratifying to me. But no matter how busy I get, I know I've got to carve out that time for the Lord. I've got to make sure that is the utmost priority of my day. As important as the rest is, as passionate as I am about the rest of it, that has to be my utmost priority. We may have a solid prayer life where we talk to God regularly, which I hope is the case for all of us. 
But sometimes we have to learn how to listen. You know, talking to God is about conversation. How many people would we have in our lives that would truly be close people in our lives if all we did was talk at them and we never listened to what they had to say? Conversation is dialogue. It's two-way. And if you've never been taught how to listen to what God has to say to you, then call me or talk to me. Stay at we'll, we'll, we'll talk that out. Because let me tell you, he has something to say to you. And he has a lot of different ways that he might say it. I personally have never heard the audible voice of God. But I have friends who have. But oh man, he speaks. I've heard him speak so clearly that it's rattled me. But if I, I wouldn't have been poised to listen, I would have missed it. It's also important for us to make note that all of this happened up on a mountaintop. You know, up on a mountain you can see things you never thought you'd see. I've seen some beautiful mountaintop views in my day, but none more spectacular than in Alaska. What a beautiful, pristine display of God's scape work. It's, it's breathtaking. I don't know how you could look out at such a beautiful landscape like that and not believe in God. I mean, you can see for miles up on a mountain with nothing obstructing your view. And all you hear is the peaceful sounds of nature. Maybe an elk off in the midst, mist. There's no hustle, there's no bustle, there's no pollution. There's no sounds of traffic. There's no YouTube videos playing everywhere. <laughs> Everything is unscathed by people who have no regard for this beautiful creation our God has blessed us with. It was so gorgeous when we were there on, on the mountains in Alaska. Thomas seen some other beautiful mountain areas like in Scotland and different places of the world, but, but Alaska, that was, that was the high for me. I've been more around beaches than mountains in my life. And as much as I wish my daughter and her husband would live closer to us, I get why they love Alaska. <laughs> But the season of Lent is not only about opening our ears to hear the voice of God more clearly, it's about opening our eyes and clearing the view to see the honest condition of our relationship with Jesus more clearly. Lent is about getting rid of the pollution that might be obstructing our ability to see God's stunning and transfiguring glory all around us. It's about tuning off, out all of the noise of this world and, and leaning in to hear more clearly the voice of God speaking over us and into us. And sometimes through us. As we prepare for Lent and begin our Lenten season this week on Ash Wednesday, I pray we will ask God what might be cluttering our view from the mountaintop, what might be plugging our ears from hearing his voice, what meaningless things and pastimes in our lives do we need to get rid of in order to see God in all of his Shekinah glory? What spiritual disciplines do we need to add to our lives to draw us closer to him? 
What worldly noises and voices are we listening to that might be drowning out the voice of God? Lent is a time to fast. It's a time. I, I have this image of those uh, Israelite men when someone died and they wrap their clothes and throw ashes and sackcloth on them and ride down on the floor because they were mourning. Lent is a time to weep and to mourn for all those things we've allowed to clutter our lives that have interfered with our relationship with God. Not to mourn for the things, but to mourn the fact that we allowed them in. It's a time to strip everything down to the bare bones. When you come here Wednesday or next Sunday, it's going to look different. You're going to see sackcloth and ashes. Lent is a time to realign, to recalibrate. As our little uh, navigation system voice would say, <laughs> recalculating. <laughs> it's about recalculating and getting us heading back due north where we should have been traveling all along. It's a time to get rid of whatever is hindering us from being closer to, the God, to our God, and it will be different for each one of us. We all have our own vices. We all have our own things in our lives that we know we need to let go of. When is the time to sanctify fast? Individually, as a church? You know, people often give up things they enjoy. The optional things in their lives that are really important to them because it shows, they feel it shows themselves humbling themselves before the Lord and, and setting him back at the highest place of importance in their lives. Acknowledging that no one and no thing in their life is more important than him. For some of us, that will be food. <laughs> Maybe one particular food, maybe all food, which is generally how I fast. For others, it might be social media, TV, Facebook. It will be different for each one of us because we all are very, have very different things in our lives that may need to come back into proper and healthy alignment for both our physical and our spiritual health. Lent is like snapping the plumb line again. And only we and our Lord knows what it is we need to lay on the altar for Lent. But I encourage you to consider that notion carefully in prayer. Consider what you feel the Lord would call you to lay down for the upcoming six weeks as we walk this holy journey to the cross together. Allowing the most high and holy God to transform us with his Shekinah glory into becoming better images of him. We are all a work in progress. Let this season of the Lent be good progress for us. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we turn our hearts to you. I ask you to speak to your people. Speak to us clearly. Speak to us boldly. Open our ears. Lay on our hearts those things that we might need to lay down, making more space for you in our lives. Whatever it is, Lord, Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us hearts that are willing, hearts that are surrendered, hearts that are even rendered as we walk closer 
to the cross. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.